Uh, there was a book called The Outliers, uh, which chronicled some of the uh, uh, lawyers that went into uh, the securities and corporate field in the mid-1950s. And it turned out that the bulk of the, of the leading ones in that f area came from the very same area in the Bronx where I grew up, and I knew a couple of them and, in fact, played with them in, in schoolyards uh, in the Bronx, and one of them actually was in my class. And they became the uh, leading uh, securities lawyers uh, in the fields. Um, so it was Herb Wachtel was a classmate of mine, and that's Wachtel Lipton, which is probably, uh, it is the most prominent firm in, in the country specializing in uh, corporate, and secure, corporate and securities work, or well, one of the most prominent ones, and uh, a couple of other firms. So. We we were again. It was I must say that it was a Jewish core, C O R E, that was involved in the book by Malcolm Gladwell, and that was the ones that became prominent because the uh, non-Jewish firms who wouldn't even hire uh, Jews when they got out of law school, including in my time, there was rampant anti-Semitism, started their own firms. And they developed these specialties where the uh, uh, so-called white shoe law firms would not dirty their hands in small public offerings of stock, in takeovers of one company by another. These were not fields that they thought were for good, well-schooled gentlemen. So a uh, whole core of Jewish guy, lawyers who grew up in the Bronx took that over. Hmm. Very lucrative area of law practice in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and today. We did, I had a law partnership with Howard Stamer, and we had working for us uh, nine lawyers. So it was two partners and nine lawyers in a townhouse in Manhattan that specialized in uh, corporate and securities work. Uh, I don't think we had any high-minded impact on, on the field in general, but we did uh, an awful lot of the medium to small size uh, companies that wanted to go public and in initial public offerings. We did an awful lot of them. In a period of 10 years, we did 200. That was 20 a year, which is almost every other week another IPO, and we cultivated and a series of smaller underwriters, not the Merrill Lynch's and the Lehman Brothers, but smaller firms that that did flourish, and and the market was markets were quite active in those in those smaller companies. Uh, that was the place that we had our primary impact. In the past thirty years, uh, my my concentration has been on uh, what we call due diligence, investigating the facts uh, involved in, an, in a securities offering so that the investors are protected, that the broker or the underwriter has carefully investigated the company and its finances. And that's a field that uh, I did a lot of work in, in practice. I did over 200 supervised or personally performed due diligence in many, many uh, private placements and initial public offerings during those years of practice from 1955 to 1975. So I think that was the niche, and I carried that over to the 30 years since then, where I've been an expert witness in uh, many of the uh, major uh, lawsuits, the, the key ones of uh, the past 20 years. Okay. So the, the last 10 years uh, I have been the mo very, very interesting uh, for me because I became the expert witness uh, for the underwriters to the public of uh, 
the three most important and highly publicized uh, cases of the 1990s and 2000s, and that is uh, WorldCom first, Enron second, and then Countrywide Financial, which was in the first decade of the uh, 21st century. In all three cases, I represented and was the sole expert witness for all of the underwriters, that is the Wall Street parties that offered the stock to the public, uh, and in each case, there was literally tens of millions of dollars that was involved in the lawsuits. The fourth, by the way, the largest, was Fannie Mae. Now, Fannie Mae turned out to be the largest because the investors there were suing for $40 billion. Uh, that case, with uh, Williams and Connolly as the counsel, and I testified again, in that case for Fannie Mae, uh, and their president was actually dismissed by the, by the judge in the case. So that was a complete victory. The others... The other three were settled for billions of dollars. That is, WorldCom, Enron, and Countrywide, which Bank of America paid billion. They were huge cases, what we call class actions, by all the investors who suffered billions of dollars of losses. They were very high-profile cases. Uh, I suppose one little anecdote was in Enron, for example, when they took my deposition, there were in a, in a room that was the size of a New York theater orchestra level, there were a hundred lawyers there with about 10 television cameras recording the deposition. Uh, <laughs> and that must have cost the relative clients of each of these maybe... Uh, $100,000 or more an hour of my testimony. So it, that, the big stakes in those kinds of cases. And it was fun. It was exciting uh, to do that work. Well, I think the funny uh, thing you know, that comes to mind in Enron, uh, since that was the case with these very, very complicated mathematical formulae and, and uh, investors entities where investors would invest that was so complex that basically nobody but the chief financial officer, Fasto, understood them. And it became clear through depositions and everything that, and some of the emails that went back and forth where people said, we don't understand this, but you know, they're, they're so successful that I don't care what, what the sigma sign means in this calculus formula. We're just going to go ahead and do it. So it was a time of wildness where everybody was afraid to admit that they didn't understand anything about the particular derivative or whatever was at stake. And they felt since they were highly paid Wall Street and Enron executives other than Fasto, they couldn't ask, what do you mean by a butterfly derivative? that's tied into a sigma uh, uh, algorithm. The, the problem in all of these cases, which involved literally hundreds of thousands of pages of, of email traffic in each one, is uh, that some of the middle-level ju and junior executives, when they got frustrated, would send telegram, emails loaded with four-letter words, obscenities, and talking about the client with the obscenity in front of it. You know, and this is going to go to a jury where, where we, have, we have the fiduciary duty, the duty to protect your client, and they're using all these horrible words and saying the idiot who's the head of the company and so on, so that the lawyers in the cases had a field day with the Wall Street. You call this person an idiot? He says, no, no, you know, they try to explain. And in one case, one case, one guy sent an email which said, and this was in WorldCom, he said, let us destroy all the records before the feds come. 
you know, this kind of, and he just meant it as sort of, uh, you know, an, uh, an elliptical kind of, you know, thing to wake up his buddy and get a laugh, but not so when you have plaintiff's class action lawyers suing for billions of dollars. They made this guy, they practically crucified him with that, with the email. So, <laughs> there you go. Now, typical day in 1955, which means the year that I uh, left Judge Kaufman as his clerk because I graduated from law school in 1954. So my first job was at the lowest level, uh, the most junior associate in the law firm of Goldstein, Judd, and Gerfine, who were very heavy-hitting uh, uh, lawyers, very good. Gerfine and Judd were in the same law school class at Harvard, and they were tied for first in the class. Gerfine became a judge in the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit with my first mm -hmm. Judge Kaufman. Uh, and uh, so when I started, and I walked in the second day I, I appeared at the law firm, and I was, you know, you'd work, you said, how was it like? Well, I'd work, um, 12, 13 hour day in Manhattan and then take the subway back to the apartment that Rosalie and I had at the Amalgamated Houses in the garden apartment there. So uh, I remember the first uh, matter that uh, I was given by Murray Gerfine, who was really in fact the senior partner of the firm. He called me in and he said, I want you to handle this certiorari and then a, a call came in, so he couldn't complete it. He said, 292 Madison Avenue. And then he took this call. So I went outside and I saw this most senior associate. And I said, I'm going to be working on a Supreme Court of the United States case. Be, and I had to explain to the lay people, a certiorari is an, a petition to the United States Supreme Court to please review my case. And then they decided, which is what they did in Leary. I prepared a petition for certiorari. They granted, I argued the case many years later. But in this case, so uh, when uh, the senior partner said, do this petition for certiorari, I ran to the senior uh, associate in the firm and said, I'm going to prepare a brief for the Supreme Court of the United States. He said, well, what's the name of the case? I said, it's a certiorari in 275 Madison Avenue. And he laughed out loud. He said, you know what, a petition for certiorari for 275 Madison Avenue, you are going to go down on behalf of a landlord who owns 275 Madison Avenue in Manhattan and plead with the city finance people to let the landlord raise the rent because we have rent control here, and that's a scut job. You gotta sit in a room with a bunch of bureaucrats and wait about four or five hours where they give you about eight minutes because it's such a democratic pro-tenant, Democratic Party pro-tenant crony who's got that job. You're gonna be denied it, but we have to do it because our landlord clients request that we do it, so don't get a base swell ahead on that one. So that taught me right off the bat that when you started in the law, you start low, low. <laughs> Nowadays, you'd be Xeroxing. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff. But the day, the typical day, was whatever one yeah, of the nine me. partners threw at you uh, during the day, and each one was not aware of what the other one had given you. So that's why you had 12-hour days, because you want to please... All the partners that assign stuff to you, you couldn't say, I got too much. Because if you ask them, they say, oh, you could do that in 10 minutes. And now, and that's nothing. So he gave up in telling them what you were doing for the other partners. <laughs>